Okay, so today we'll be talking about the Choctaw Rocket, Choctaw Route, and briefly uh, the Missouri Pacific that went to Hot Springs, Arkansas. So let's just jump right into it. So we're going to be talking here about the outline. So we're going to be talking about the construction of the railroad, Hot Springs, Arkansas, passenger trains on the Rock Island, the Choctaw Rocket, and the subsequent dismantling of the Choctaw Route. I'm not really talking about the Missouri Pacific in this one just briefly because it's going to come up and uh, they don't really come up in any other videos and we'll get into why in a moment. And let's, uh, this is just, you know, a random Rock Island steam driven passenger train with, I think, heavyweight cars, maybe wood. I'm not really sure. I just uh, yanked the picture, I think, from either Wikipedia or Pinterest. I don't really know where they, some of these come from. Anyways, this is the uh, Choctaw and other routes that we'll be talking about today. So this also is sort of an outgrowth of the Rock Island wanting a transcontinental route to the Pacific as well, and them subsequently never making it and only going as far as to come carry to Mexico. Technically, they made it to Santa Rosa, but I believe the switchover was mostly in Tucum Carry because that's where the two routes split. This northern line up here is the Golden State route that continued on to Chicago and St. Louis. And uh, the interchange point was moved to Tucum Carry in 1907, and I believe it was like 1903 when this was fully finished and connected. Sorry, this keeps popping up. The Choctaw Route itself was built by the Choctaw, Oklahoma, and Gulf Railroad, and this railroad started out primarily hauling coal in 1888, and it was in 1900 that the route was extended between West Memphis and Oklahoma City, which is roughly here on the line. Hopefully you can see the um, arrow in the screen capture. And by 1903, the Rock Island had fully taken over the Choctaw Railroad and was drawing up plans for one final extension through Amarillo to Tucumcari to link up with the Southern Pacific and be more or less fully integrated into the Rock Island proper. I mean, it kind of was because, I mean, there's the El Reno um, interchange, but, you know, again, they wanted better connections. And from what I can tell is I sometimes talk about how the natives feel this. I don't think they liked the railroads. I've come across other reporting about how they didn't really the natives specifically that got relocated to oklahoma through the trail of tears didn't really like the railroads because it was just more land stealing and brought in more um settlers which made life harder on them so i'm um, from what i can gather they weren't really a fan of the railroad at least in oklahoma again different tribes probably had different opinions because it's not like everyone's a monolith and i mean it's fairly easy to see that these are basically quasi-government um initiative since they're getting land grants to build the railroads i know people some people in the comments don't consider that a subsidy but i do because the government doesn't like spending money but it has a lot of land and it's basically cash in these days so you know i consider it a subsidy or at least a reward and the choctaw railroad initially started offering tribes 25 dollars per acre of land that they wanted so they could build a railroad which was an amount prescribed by congress they said no and um by the way two 25 dollars is like 700 and some odd dollars these days so it's not really a lot of money i know oklahoma is like not seen as being like the most economically powerful state but i mean 740 dollars for an acre is like i'm pretty sure is below what their real estate market is now um, and obviously the railroad did get built eventually, but this is more of a sidebar uh, to show that not every tribe liked the railroads. And some of them didn't like it because of the association with the government and having just been displaced. And I think by the time uh, this happened, it would have been the grandchildren of the people who got marched um, through, on the Trail of Tears, I think, would have been the people uh, running a lot of these tribes by then. So, you know, again, would have heard stories from their grandparents growing up about how, you know, the government, well, frankly, screwed them over. I don't have a nicer way to put that. Um, anyways, kicking it over one more, whoops, go back. So I forgot to put an image of Hot Springs in here, but Hot Springs, Arkansas is um, a topic that's coming up now uh, for a few reasons. Uh, the first one being is that two railroads ran here, and the second one being there really isn't a better time to bring this up. The Choctaw had a branch line, which is shown here in blue, that connected to Hot Springs in 1890. And unlike the other national parks that have come up on this channel, its history actually predates the coming of the railroads. The natives of the region had been coming to the area for as long as their oral histories existed, and there was a main push in 1820 by the Arkansas legislature to have the area designated as off-limits to development. They wanted the area to be declared a reservation by Congress. And um, in this context, it's reservation for conservation, not as an Indian reservation, because, I mean, they're not getting, <laughs> the government back then was not giving them the choice of land. Let's, let's just gloss over a whole bunch of history that I frankly could 
I could do a whole video on, but I'm not going to because that's not what this channel's uh, point is, unfortunately. Anyways, the area was signed, um, became a preservation thanks to an act in Congress in 1832 by President Andrew Jackson, who also was the guy who did the Trail of Tears. So yeah, not a great guy. May have saved a state park or whatever, but yeah, not really great. Uh, the issue with this was that Congress didn't do anything to set up the, a way to administer the land. And but this is generally considered the first national park because it predated Yellowstone by 40 years. And by 1849, there were legal disputes over the boundaries of the reservation and subsequent ownership of the park. These claimants wanted to develop the land for tourism. And these cases weren't settled until 1877 when the courts did conclude that the park was owned by the government and specifically the, the Department of the Interior. And... This was created in the late 1840s, around the time these lawsuits started cropping up. And in 1878, a new survey was done to confirm the boundaries of the park. And any land not within the boundary that was being claimed was then sold off. And probably other subsequent lands that no one really cared about at the time. Anyways, 1880, the 1880s saw the construction of the bathhouses and the plumbing that would start to make the park what it is today. These Victorian-era bathhouses were far better than what was available in the early years of the park. And the slow development would continue through to 1888 and the coming of the railroads two years later. And it wouldn't be until 1916 with the passage of the National Parks Act that Hot Springs would officially become the 18th national park in the system, even though it was already basically a national park. And through the 1930s, a water distribution system was created along with new bathhouses. And this time was the peak of bathing in the park, and by the 1970s, most of the bathhouses had closed, and their buildings had been subjected to adaptive reuse. The The Fort Ice, which was the largest and most elegant of the bath, bathhouses, is now the visitor center. And um, while I mention it, the uh, railroads did kind of a subdued affair serving this area. The Missouri Pacific just ran through cars, which, um, again, if you can see the the um, arrow, the Missouri Pacific came down here from, I believe, uh, Cairo, Cairo, through New Madrid, down into, wait, no. They came along this blue line, sorry, from St. Louis into um, Little Rock. And this the, the one, the lower part, is actually the Rock Island line. I think it's one of these sec secondary lines is the Missouri Pacific line into Hot Springs, but it was also a branch line, so it's probably not shown on this map. So yeah, it was they just would split off cars at somewhere along the Missouri Pacific mainland and just shunt them down the line to the National Park. So it was more of a subdued affair. So getting into the Rock Island locals along this line, they did have um, the Memphis Little Rock train, the Apache California Cherokee, which was the secondary train sort of deal, like at least equivalent of a secondary train that ran to Los Angeles, the Choctaw Limited, which is the train that the Choctaw Rocket repl replaced, and the Chicago Hot Springs Limited. And um, since we're on the subject of the of Hot Springs, let's just briefly go over this. So. Most people probably know what a through car is. A through car is basically when they just split off a few cars from a main train and run it down a branch line. And uh, this was common at Yellowstone along the Burlington, the Northern Pacific, and the uh, Milwaukee Road. And I feel like the Chicago Northwestern did as well. The Rock Island train to the Hot Springs, the Chicago Hot Springs Limited, was a bit more interesting. It ran as part of the of an Illinois Central train from Chicago to Memphis, Tennessee. And at Memphis, the Rock Island cars would be split off and then run to Hot Springs. And this train had at least a parlor car, a couple coaches, and a sleeper during its uh, existence. So more than just uh, through cars, and but not really a full train. We'll get into this in a minute, but that's about how big the uh, Choctaw Rocket was. Anyways, let's just get into the passenger trains. So prior to the Choctaw Rocket, as I said, there are these trains that are up here on the list. There was a Memphis Little Rock Local and the train that ran to Los Angeles. And um, as mentioned, sometime at some point, the Apache was renamed the Memphis Californian. And sometime in the 1930s, when the California was launched, that's when it was renamed. And then there was the Choctaw Limited, which ran through from Memphis to Oklahoma City. Again, just these are mostly just heavyweight trains. Anyways, as I mentioned, the Californian did go through a few name changes. It was always a secondary train that ran through to Los Angeles, but it didn't have a consistent name. The Memphis Californian, after 
it was called the Apache, then became the Memphis, California, and then eventually it was renamed the Cherokee sometime after World War II. As far as I can tell, the Imperial always ran the Golden State route to St. Louis and Chicago. And by always, I mean at least after 1930. And uh, the California was a depression air train that was meant to compete with the LA Challenger, as far as I can tell. And the California was dropped at some point, and the Memphis branch was retained uh, since it was the only train to LA on the Choctaw route. And again, it was mostly a secondary train akin to the Lake Imperial, and I think they even ran through with each other after a while. So again, going to be more like this deal. <laughs> it's also kind of weird that the observation cars on the end, I just realized that with the Rock Island picture on the screen right now, I just realized that, that the observation cars at the front of the train, not the end of the train. <laughs> Anyways, yes, a little bit of unwieldy video today, but you know, let's see where we're going. This isn't a picture of the Choctaw rocket. I think this is just another rocket running out of um, Chicago, but... You know, it works for here. One of the was a DL-60 uh, locomotives and just random cars, a heavyweight, probably a uh, mail car, and then just standard rocket cars down the end. Anyways, the Choctaw rocket was one of the many rockets launched by the Rock Island during the Streamline era. This one was a bit special compared to the other rockets, which is kind of why it's getting its own video, along with the Choctaw route being interesting to me. <laughs> And the main reason as to why I consider it special was that it had a sleeping car. It was, in a way, a hybrid between the more normal rockets, which are more akin to Amtrak state supported services, and the Twin Star and Rocky Mountain rockets, which were long distance routes, um, like many other trains I've talked about on this video, at least mainline trains. And the Choctaw rocket was um, short like the other rockets, like meaning the Corn Belt rocket sort of deal, that, like, which was, I think, the train that went from Chicago to Des Moines or Chicago. Des Moines, Omaha. So, you know, that route. Basically, the modern Iowa Interstate Railway is the route railroad it ran. But as mentioned, it did have a sleeping car. The uh, Choctaw did. And the train was generally four cars long. It had its head-in car, a coach, a sleeper, and a diner lounge. This train likely had some variation in the concept based on demand, but most like most routes have during their peak season. But the main concept was a short four cars, which is comparable to the Corn Belt rocket and the other such rockets that mostly ran out of Kansas City. Another oddity of the Choctaw rocket was that its equipment was built by Pullman. Most of the other rockets had uh, bud-built equipment, much like the Burlington had with its later Zephyrs. And just kick it over. So here's just a poster of the Choctaw rocket, uh, Pullman cars. Now again, all built by Pullman Standard. Fairly odd for the Rock Island. I do believe it had some enclosed bedrooms on the on the car, which I kind of was weird. I mean, the Rock Island was kind of behind the times a little bit with the faster trains, at least pre World War II. You know, compared to the other ones. Like I know for certain the uh, what's it called Rocky Mountain rocket was ordered with open sections still, even though it was a streamlined train in the 30s when that was going out of style. So anyways, let's just kick it over to the food. So the food service on the Rock Island was a bit standard for lack of a better term. I have used these uh, menus before in previous videos. If you've seen any of the previous videos, you know, hi, new people. If you're uh, not a new person, if you're one of the regular viewers, I have used these before, specifically in the Golden State video, and I believe the Rocky Mountain Rocket I've might have used one of these. Uh, one of these guys. So if you've seen this, is going to be more of a rehash for past viewers, or for my longer time viewers. And these two menus are, I believe, from the Golden State Limited. It did. The white one is the breakfast menu, and the purplish pink one is the lunch menu. And as one commenter put it, the Rock Island is a working class operation, so its breakfasts were more basic and more filling and less fancy. So they have on their breakfast menu like various scrambles, continental breakfast, a lot of a la carte options. And the lunch menu is their main selection is what? Is it a broiled sausage and a fish fillet, you know, with potatoes and vegetables and probably bread and a drink? And, you know, again, all the other various... Uh, a la carte options like sandwiches, a cheese sandwich, uh, lettuce, which is probably a salad, hamburger, um, cheese, ham and cheese sandwich, and just assorted other stuff. And uh, again, one of them, I th yeah, one of these actually is chips, like the American sense, not um, British sense of chips. And one thing I will say about the Rock Island and Southern Pacific's food service is that it was pretty average for the day, even when they did care about their food service, which isn't to say that it was bad. What I'm saying by that is it was standard as and it wasn't the trend-setting railroad. 
for the Western Railroads, the Union Pacific and the Santa Fe were generally the trendsetters when it came to food service, and pretty much every source and every person I've managed to talk to or read about in a forum have said that they would be in spots one or two, and the preference would generally depend on which one they rode more frequently. At least as far as the West Coast goes, I have no idea (laughs) about the Eastern Railroads. I haven't gotten there, so I don't really know. Anyways, um, let's just get into the dismantling of the Choctaw route. And the Choctaw route is one of those other routes we lost during the 20th century. And the Choctaw rocket was eventually downgraded to an RDC service between Memphis and Oklahoma City in 1953 and was renamed the Choctaw Rocket, which lasted until 1958. And from 1958 until 1964, the train ran as an unnamed RDC, just lost its name altogether, just a number at that point. And this is one. This was one of the longest RDC routes in the country. The only one that was longer was the Western Pacific's Oakland to Salt Lake City secondary train, and this was the secondary run to the California Zephyr along the Western Pacific. And that, towards the end of its uh, existence, was mostly a way of shuttling railroad workers around. And the Rock Island's last RDC trundled around the Rock Island route until 1964, when it too was canceled. As far as I can tell, the Cherokee. Uh, It was canceled at some point, I'm guessing, in the 60s. And since this train ran as a segment of the Imperial, I would imagine that um, it ran across the whole of the Choctaw route to the L.A. Since So it would have sort of gone all the way into L.A. even if the Choctaw rocket stopped (laughs) or had less uh, connections. And um, I'm not entirely sure when it fully stopped since I don't have like a late in life rock Island schedule that I can find and look at. And by that, I mean like 65 to 69. I know there was a train running from Tucum carry to Memphis in 1964, which is unnamed, but I think it carries the same numbers that they had or would usually use for the uh, Cherokee. So I'm guessing is that it still ran through to 64, even if it was just like a through car operation. So I'm guessing 64 was more or less the end of pastor service on the uh, Choctaw route. So the Choctaw route largely doesn't exist today. Back when the route was still running, the South had nowhere near as much uh, manufacturing as there is now. So the Choctaw didn't see as much freight traffic as it would today. Although there are major manufacturing centers in places like Tennessee with its Nissan plant, there wasn't such of a case back then. As explored in other videos about the Rock Island, and specifically the one where I talk about the failures of the Rock Island and Milwaukee Road, the main issue for both of them was a lack of online traffic sources. Um, so now it might make sense to have the Choctaw route, but since there's other ways around it, it's just never been reactivated. But back then there just wasn't demand for it. Unfortunately, even though it looked good on a map and looked like it would make sense, it just didn't. And now, as far as I can tell, the route exists in four separate segments that act as feeder lines to like BNSF and Union Pacific and railroads have found alternative routes. So no one really needs it now. At one point, the Rock Island was attempting to fix up the line, and this went on after um, the failed murder of the Union Pacific, as far as I can tell, and some figure that they were attempting to sell the route off. As far as I can find, the only uh, potential buyer was the Santa Fe, and they eventually passed on it, likely due to its poor track condition and um, not-so-great business proposal at the time. The Rock Island had deferred maintenance of its right-of-ways, to the point where some trains were literally falling off the tracks. Um, I joke a little bit. That's more of the uh, Penn Central. Like they, I think they actually did like do like a documentary or a please give us money video. And they actually did like have a car fall off the tracks behind. And it was kind of funny. Um, anyways, the rock Island from what I can, or the not rock Island, but the the Choctaw route from what I can tell was, uh, probably in one of the worst shape, at least as far as the rock Island's network went. And even after some moderate rehabilitation, it was one of the least lucrative, and uh, this is one of those times where I will bring up that the Rock Island should merge with the SP or the Cotton Belt, uh, which, again, you can watch in the dedicated video on the um, failures of the Rock Island and Milwaukee Road, since I do actually go into why that was the case. And the long story short was the uh, SP was going to eat most of the Rock Island anyways, so it kind of made sense that they would do it. So kind of just leave it there. This is going to be the end of this video, and I hope you did enjoy. And remember, like, share, subscribe. There is a Discord now if you want to use that. It's like literally the only way to get a hold of me besides saying something in the comments. Anyways, thank you for watching, and I hope you did enjoy, and I will see you in the next one.